Welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast, where mental health professionals share information and perspectives that illuminate, educate, and is worthy of a mental note. And now your host, Chris Quarto. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm your host, Chris Quarto. I hope you're getting off to a good start in 2017. You know, uh, people oftentimes make resolutions at the start of the year. And, you know, usually to make positive changes in their lives. And I I don't usually make resolutions, but I did this year. And actually, my resolution pertains to my podcast series. I resolved to bring the Make a Mental Note podcast series to an end, but replace it with a new podcast series called Private Practice Journeys. I've mentioned this before. If you're interested in starting or expanding a private practice, then this is something that you want to check out. Uh, Unlike other podcasts where hosts focus on interviewing a different therapist every week, and actually that's what I did with the Make a Mental Note podcast, I'm only interviewing four therapists on this one who are starting or expanding their practices. And I'm interviewing each of them once a month throughout 2017. So you and the other listeners can get the real scoop on what it's like to build a practice. So keep an eye out for it. It's starting soon. Well, today's guest is Neil Brown, who's going to be talking about families that experience conflict and what they can do to improve their relationships. I really enjoyed talking to Neil. He, uh, he had some great insights into uh, understanding families and really good techniques on how to help them. So without further ado, here's Neil. Hi, everyone. This is Chris Quarto, and welcome again to the Make a Mental Note podcast. I'm joined today by Neil Brown, who's a licensed clinical social worker. And Neil, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Chris. Nice to be here. And Neil, whereabouts are you located in the United States? I am in the northern tip of the Monterey Bay in California. I'm in the town of Santa Cruz, California. Oh, I bet that's beautiful out there. It is. I feel very lucky to be here. Well, I'll tell you right now, in Tennessee, I'm uh, located a little bit south of Nashville. We're in the uh, low 30s today. <laughs> We're supposed to get snow tonight, so I'd rather be out in California right now. But okay. but I appreciate you coming on the podcast. And uh, what I like to do, Neil, is when I start off the podcast episodes, is just to have my guests say a little bit about who they are and what they do for a living. So uh, why don't you tell the metal note takers a little bit about yourself? Okay, well, I'm a uh, psychotherapist in private practice. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. All right. Um, I've been in private practice since 1984. Mm -hmm. I'm with a specialty in uh, families and couples. I've worked uh, my, before I went into full-time private practice, I was the program manager of a youth and family counseling agency. All right. And I developed a lot of uh, skill, I guess, experience with adolescents and their families because those were the cases that were coming there. They were kids that were largely adjudicated, so they were coming in through the probation department. So these were kids that were struggling with healthy decision-making and their families. So I developed an interest and skill set in that particular area, and I've been working to develop that as well as other skills along the way. Wonderful. Well, you and I have been in this field for about the same time, Neil, because I started in 1984. I, I started my work in a community mental health center being the jack of all trades. And I'll tell you that that nothing more stressful than that. And um, after a a couple of years of that, I decided, ah, this is probably a good time for me to go on and get some extra education. And, uh, but I'll, I I will never, I would never trade that uh, experience for, for anything. I think it was a really good uh, foundation. And um, it sounds like you've had a lot of good, a lot of good foundational work too, for what you're doing. Well, and I recommend that for people entering the field is, for them to work in an agency where they got challenging clients, yeah. lots of supervision and training, and uh, and get you know get hours and hours and hours of experience. That's where you get it. I agree. I totally agree with that. Well, yeah. Neil, so so let's hear a little bit about your story about uh, why you went into the the helping profession. I mean, not everybody does that, and uh, but yet you thought it was a, a good. Um, career move for you. So what uh, made you decide to go into this profession? Well, I think being a helper has always been my nature. So Mm. I think that 
I think I was born with that or it evolved in my own family of origin, uh-huh. one or the other, a combination of both. And I was, as a college graduate with a degree in psychology, I was working in the VISTA program, Volunteers in Service to America, the sure. American the Domestic Peace Corps. And mm-hmm. at that time, I was working in a school for developmentally delayed uh, children and young adults in a very, very rural southern Colorado. And when I was working there, uh, I went out to the very far reaches of the San Luis Valley where I was and met with the families, the parents of these kids. They were dirt poor, mm-hmm. sometimes burning their fence for heat wow. in the winter times, going down to the river, breaking the ice for their water, uh-huh. and, uh, and mostly Spanish-speaking. And I was barely Spanish-speaking, but... Anyway, I got the point across that I really enjoyed their kids and really appreciated who they were as a family, and yeah. I just wanted to make contact with them, and sometimes we had potlucks at the center and brought them in, and, and I realized then that when I had made contact with the families, that somehow the kids perked up, that somehow it was an esteeming experience for them huh. and then coming to school they felt better about themselves they worked harder they were more engaged we went to the special olympics and it seemed like there was some sort of magic in working with the family huh. that unleashed itself with the kid uh-huh. so it was then and there that i said you know there's this family thing that goes on i need to get on top of that and then i looked around at the different professions and the school of social work at the university of denver had Family Therapy 1 and Family Therapy 2 in its curriculum, I said, that's for me. Wow. So there I went. And Isn't that interesting? I got turned on to structural family therapy at that time, and uh-huh. I, I've just been a, a student of family therapy and a theoretician ever since. Wow. That's fantastic. I think that we've had a, a guest on the show who have had a similar interest in doing family work, and some of them have uh, mentioned that um, based on their own family experiences, some of what have been dysfunctional, not not all, but some of which have been dysfunctional, that that was something that really kind of kind of motivated them to go into the field. But yours is a, a, a different type of story. Yours is based more on on helping these these poor people and finding out that there was something to that, that there was a spark to, to what you were doing with them. And, and, uh, sounds like that really resonated with you, Neil. Well, it sure did. And, uh, I've just been consumed with it and, and family therapy is not an easy therapy mm. to learn and, and practice. It's, mm-hmm. There's a lot of complexity in both in the, in the theory and practice. And so it's taken me a while to, to get that level of expertise and, and to and to bring you know bring myself to the profession it's a it's a it's a labor of love but a labor it is <laughs> well that's one of the things i i wanted to talk to you about today actually is a little bit about the family work uh because i know that uh You've written a book on on parents and teens, and I want to talk to you about that in a little while. But just to talk to you a little bit more now about your your thinking about um, working with families and some of the issues that they present, and uh, your thinking about you know how. What makes them tick and why they have these problems? And are there any commonalities in the families that you see? So maybe you could talk a little bit about some of those issues, Neil. Okay, Chris. Well, the the thing about being a therapist is no one comes to see you, A, unless they've got a problem, Mm -hmm. and then B, unless they've been trying to solve the problem, but the solution really hasn't paid off. Yes. So people don't wake up one day and say, hey, we've got a problem, let's go to a therapist. They wake up one day and have a problem, and the next day they still have the problem, and they do something about the problem, but it doesn't change anything. Right. And then after a while, they feel like this, this problem is really now central to their family life, and they really can't move forward. And when they get uncomfortable enough, that's when they come into family therapy. Mm-hmm. So, so the commonality among the families that come in is that they have developed patterns of interaction that are now both invisible but enduring. So they're not seeing the pattern, they're just experiencing the impact of the pattern ah. on, their, on, on the symptom that they're coming in with. I see. So, yeah, so they're really, they're really being controlled by the symptom and by this pattern of interaction, which has become so familiar that it's, 
uh, that it's managing them instead of them managing it. Right. So, you know, the way that you're kind of describing this to me, be, being a, a colleague, I, I totally get this and I understand what you're saying. And I'm sure most of our audience does, too. But for the family that's actually coming in to see you, I imagine that when you're working with them, you just can't you can't describe it in the same way that you did to me, that there's a different way of communicating these things to them. So how is it that you go about kind of communicating this to them in a way that they understand it um, so they can start to make some changes? Mm -hmm. Well, that is the, uh, that is the important question. And that's what I think makes family therapy such a challenging modality to use because, because you're really needing everyone in the family to own some responsibility for their participation in the pattern and own some responsibility for changing the mm-hmm. pattern. So right. in order to do that, it's important to get to the subject of the pattern itself. We, if otherwise, we're going to land on the notion of who's at fault, because the kid is going to go, oh, my the problem is my parents, they're too oppressive and too controlling, and I have to do what I do with, in a, as a way to fight their control. Right. And then parents are going to go, well, we have to be controlling because you won't use your self-control. Mm-hmm. And, and so if a therapist, a young therapist, will side with the kid and ask the parents to be less controlling, and the elder therapist will side <laughs> with the parents and uh, tell the kid they need to shape up, but... But really what we want to do is help the parents and the kid create an alignment against the, prob- against the pattern itself. And so in my book, I know we want to talk about the book a little later, but right. it, it's hard to separate my practice and what I do. Oh, that's from fine. The book yeah, that's fine. So in the book, what I'll do is I personify the pattern, and I call it the beast. I call it the control battle, and then I give the control battle a personification and i call it the beast ah and then what i invite I, what i do is i invite families uh to starve the beast and I, then we can look at all the behaviors the parental behaviors and the child behaviors and sometimes the pattern of interaction between the parents as well as all pieces of uh, nutrients for the beast and so we can look at all those beast feeding behaviors, and then the beast starving behaviors. And then it becomes a challenge and sometimes almost a game to starve the beast and let the family win the battle against the beast. And I think if I can create an alignment with, within the family against the pattern or the beast, now they have a common enemy and they can work together and things uh, start to move forward. That's fascinating. And so what you're trying to do really is to is to get them to stop attacking one another and to incorporate a basically like a third element or a third entity into this where they can kind of gang up against this third entity and, and not against one another. Is that sort of what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. And then it takes the whole notion of blame out of it instead of hmm. uh, I'm, I'm the way I am because you're the way you are and it's your fault. And we get the whole notion of fault out of the family. And then we just have a, a, uh, a goal and a set of challenges together to starve this beast. Have you found, Neil, in, in your work and in, in doing this sort of thing that there's any resistance among any of the family members to kind of go into this direction of a third entity? Do, do any of the family members any ever resist doing that, going along with that? Well, you know, as, as I'm sure you know, when you're, working with, uh, when you're working as a therapist and you have clients, certain things are going to ring true for certain clients. Mm-hmm. Things are going to be culturally relevant or, or, or personally relevant. So it's not necessarily, this is not necessarily something I'll do in every case, right? but it's something that I've evolved that works in many, many cases. Mm -hmm. So, and sometimes it might take several sessions before we introduce this concept. It's not something people walk in the door and then I feed them the concept. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm a therapist first and I think it's, and of course all family therapists are therapists and then family therapists. So we need to make sure 
that our clients feel like we get how the world looks through their eyes and we have empathy right. for how the world looks through their eyes and we know what they're struggling with so that then when we get into the prescription for how we're going to move forward, the prescription is actually relevant in a very detailed and specific and therapeutically relevant way. Mm-hmm. Say a little bit. Sense? Yeah. And, and I was just because you use the word prescription and a lot of the listeners, they may not be totally familiar with uh, this is a family therapy term, I think. And so they may not be totally familiar with this. Maybe you could talk a little bit more about what you're referring to with the prescription. OK, well, you know, I think there's you know, there's obviously very different models of psychotherapy, mm-hmm. and family therapy tends to be, in most cases, there are different models, but most family therapy models are directive. In okay. other words, in those cases, the, fa- the therapist is going to take a pretty active role in saying what they think and then encouraging certain behaviors. So they're going to, they're gonna, in a sense, prescribe the way forward. And I think uh, another Another school of thought that really supports this comes out of the Mental Research Institute and the, and the brief therapy model that came out of there. All right. Uh, and that was in the 60s out of Palo Alto. And, uh, and the book that, uh, that is the foundation of that thinking is a book called Change. Uh-huh. And in that book, you know, they look at what really creates change in family dynamics. How do you create change in human behavior? And they looked at the difference between first-order change, which is uh, making a change, but it's making a change within the same paradigm. So ultimately, it doesn't really shift out uh-huh. into something new and uh, ultimately enduring, sustainable, and productive. And then second-order change, which is on a different axis, which actually changes the whole interactional pattern and changes uh, the experience of the participants. And so as a family therapist, I'm always looking for second-order change. How do we get from here to there? And using an active therapeutic model, we get all the data, we look at who people are, we look at what their experience is, and then the therapist moves forward with their concept, which in this case is, is looking at the pattern of interaction among them and then inviting the family members to make a significant change in that pattern. And that means the therapist has to give them guidance as to what that, the new behavior is going to look like. Sometimes it involves coaching the new behavior. Sometimes it means writing up a prescription uh, sometimes it means several sessions to help uh, a client build the tool that's going to allow them to follow a prescription. Uh-huh. But it's an active it's an active approach where the therapist is very directive. I think you just answered my next question. I was I was going to ask you about your your recipe for success. About how how is it that you get people, families, to kind of move from point A when they're first coming in to see you to point B. And in this description that you just gave of, of this approach, I think really kind of ties it all together, kind of explains how that's done. And um, But I think that, you know, for us talking about this, this seems like a very straightforward approach. It makes sense. Uh, but yet, I'm sure that there are a lot of challenges involved in doing this kind of work, right? And and what are the primary challenges in working with, with families, Neil? What have you found? Well, uh, I think the, the challenges involve being able to do several things at the same time because it's, the therapist has to maintain contact with all the individuals uh-huh. in the family at the same time that they're keeping their own uh, model in their mind about what health for this family looks like. And so we're looking at what's going on with each person. Then we're looking at the interactional patterns among the participants. Mm-hmm. And then we're looking at how are, a model for how we're going to transform that into a model of health. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot to keep track of. I think that's the biggest challenge is it's a lot to keep track of. But I would say this, it, you know, as a therapist who's been in the field now for 40 years, um, it still keeps me it still keeps me challenged and interested. I bet. Yeah. yeah. 
exciting. I mean, every day is uh, the curtain goes up, and it's uh, it's fascinating theater in the consulting room. You know, and I you know, and I agree. I, I the longer I've been in the field, the more I'm convinced of, of what I don't know. <laughs> you know, there, there's so much I want to learn, and and so much I don't know, and. Um, I've always found family therapy, at least the theory, uh, to be fascinating, but also quite complex. So we have uh, graduate students who listen to this podcast, Neil, and I'm wondering, you know, what kind of advice can you give them in terms of learning learning family therapy theory and, and applying that? I mean, how do you learn about all these complexities of working with families? Yeah, well, that's a really important question, Chris, for what I think is uh, a very, I think it's a difficult question to answer because I don't think that there are a lot of family therapists doing training, and I don't think there are a lot of family therapists being trained. I think what's happened over the last number of years with the influences of, uh, of the medical models and which which emphasize uh, in, individual um, s- symptoms and individual therapy and, and uh, insurance companies, which emphasize uh, individual therapy and symptoms within an individual and individual pathology that they don't allow for and don't encourage family thinking. Yes. And then, of course, we've got a proliferation of parenting models. And, and a lot of therapists go to a parenting model as an alternative to family therapy. So let's say you've got um, an acting out teenager or even a depressed teenager, then what the therapist is going to do, they're going to do individual therapy with the teenager. Right. And then they're going to have uh, maybe a phone conversation or 10 minutes with a parent in the waiting room or in the consulting room before or after a session or a phone call or right. um, maybe even a, a parent session for now or then. But it's really going to be focused on as, with the kid as the element of pathology of, of the, identi- the, the teenager or the kid as the identified patient, and then the parents just getting parenting advice for going forward. And that's not family therapy. Yeah. Family therapy is working, not necessarily always having them all in there together, but always having that concept of changing the patterns of interaction. Right. And I think it's very important for therapists to understand that uh, parent, uh, healthy parenting models, which are very important. I think it's fabulous that parents now have some of these great models, mm-hmm. positive parenting program and others are very, uh, very productive and very useful. But that's not the same. Once a family has gotten into a negative pattern, coming out of it is a very difficult thing to do. And then you need a full bag of therapeutic tools. So yeah, be humble, take your time, get trained, uh, find uh, some family therapists that you can believe in. Find some family therapy models that you can believe in, and then uh, stick with them for a decade. Mm-hmm. You know, it'll take it'll take ten years before yeah. you're going to feel like an expert. So stay with it. Yeah, that's that's great advice, and I I agree. I think that sometimes um, there are graduate students who go through programs that might have a course on family therapy but they don't get the training in family therapy. I mean, the, the real applied experiences. And I think the supervision uh, from, from somebody who thinks from a system standpoint, I think that's totally different from a supervisor who's just trained in more of an individual type of model and aren't, is, aren't used to thinking in terms of uh, along the systems line. So I think that that really has a lot to do with it too. It absolutely does. So if you're going to be a family therapist, then you need to find family therapists to train with. Absolutely. Yes. And then there are training institutes. You know, I went to the Philadelphia Child Guidance uh, Center and got uh, a month-long training there. Ah. And Mnuchin was still the director. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and then uh, after that, we brought uh, – well, when I was the program manager at a youth and family counseling agency, I brought – uh, John Sargent, who now he's uh, he's a professor of uh, child psychiatry at Tufts. Okay. But he was a trainer at the uh, Philadelphia Child Guidance Center for my small group, 
And uh, we brought him out to Santa Cruz and spent a week with us training our whole staff. We put in a viewing mirror. Oh, wow. Station system. And so that way, I mean, we took therapy out of the shadows and, yeah. and, and put it in the light and said, let's look at who, what we're doing and let's look at these families and let's get our opinions going and let's, let's learn and grow together. Oh, how cool is that? I, I bet that yeah. was a fantastic experience. Yeah, here I am talking about it uh, 35 <laughs> years later. So, yeah, that was a profound experience, and I'm thrilled to have had it, and I want to encourage other people to sure. uh, go there. Well, Neil, you wrote a book, uh, Ending the Parent-Teen Control Battle, and um, I want you to say a little bit about that. First of all, why, why you wrote the book, and tell a little bit about uh, the contents and uh, how that might um, help uh, graduate students or professionals in the field or even uh, even the lay people who are listening to this podcast? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, the book is written uh, for parents All right. as the primary audience. And uh, the reason I wrote the book is it there just wasn't a parenting book that really spoke to uh, in, a, in a way that truly emphasizes the patterns of interactions that go into uh, that go on when families are in trouble. Right. Uh, there's a lot on what parents should or shouldn't do. There are books on how to deal with um, defiant kids, how to deal with oppositional kids, how to deal with depression, how to, and then how to do generic parenting of a teenager and lots of information on teenagers. Right. But this is a book that really needed to be written to focus on what happens when you're already in the soup from a family therapy perspective. Mm. And so that was my or that was why I wrote the book and I got a lot of encouragement to write it, Chris. I you know I'm not a I never thought of myself as a writer, uh -huh. but I had um I had clients who were educators and they were saying, "Would you come and speak to the parents at our school?" And I I'd say, "Sure, but why me? There's a lot of people who could talk about adolescence." They said, "Well, your message is different. Huh. Come and and speak." And so I did and then one time there was someone in the audience who said, you should write a book. And I said, well, I don't know how to write a book. And she <laughs> said, well, I'm a publisher. I know how to write a book. Come and talk to oh, me. Oh, wow. So I did, and she started. She got an editor for me and started me writing the book. And, and, uh, and then life got busy, and the economy took some turns. And actually, I started working as a management consultant in industry for about 10 years. Is that right? Went on, yeah. And then, so the book went on the back burner for a while, and then, uh, and then I pulled it out again because it was still on my bucket list. Mm -hmm. I said, you know, I, I really need to finish my book. Mm -hmm. And so I did, and I got more help, and, and then a publisher picked it up, and before you know it, out came my book. So how do you, uh, I, I'm sure that you recommend the book to your clients, and, uh, you know, how do you um, think that this could help parents and, and teens uh, and how would you incorporate this in, as part of your work with families? Well, he, here's it's been fabulous. I mean, I have now when a family comes in, they mostly know that I've written a book because they go on my website and they yeah. see the book. They're referred to me and they say, oh, and Neil wrote a book on this subject. So uh, most people know about the book when they come in and yeah. they may have already picked up a copy. And so now we already have the language. They're already moving forward in that direction. Huh. And it, it really inspires them. And then a lot of the, lot of the tools that it's going to take to end the parent team control battle are already in the book, and they're self-identifying their own problems, their own behaviors. And huh. saying, oh, I'm using a negative tone, aren't I? I guess I'm feeding the beast. <laughs> right? Wow. Right. And then I did a training about, for about 25 therapists here locally last month or the month before, actually. And, uh, and uh, they say that you know, since they've uh, done the training and their clients are reading the book, that it's that just having the book available to their clients really helps everyone get on board for how to think about things yeah. uh, more actively. And then I've gotten comments from across the country and even from across the world uh, from people saying, well, I read your book and it's already making a difference. Wow. Isn't that great? So, that, that's got to oh, be... It's so gratifying, Chris. I, I bet it is. Just, um, it brings tears to my eyes. I just can't even tell you that... Because that's where I am now. It's like, you know, I want to make a difference. I want to yeah. bring this message forward in a way that is going to be 
specifically um, specifically helpful to families everywhere. I, I live in a small little community, and uh, before I retire, which I actually don't have any plans to retire, but I am getting of that age, uh-huh. uh, I, uh, I want to get the word out there, and I want to help people benefit from my years in the consulting room. Sure. What What's really neat about this is that everybody, when they read the book, when parents read this book, they learn the lingo and they kind of learn the concept. So everybody's kind of on the same page. And I'm sure that that's got to help so much in, in the therapy that you do. It really does. And one chapter in it that I think is, uh, is an important one is, uh, is the chapter called Making the Big Shift. So in, in the first part of the book, I've described the control battle. And then I've talked about what feeds the beast and the behavior's that end up feeding a beast. And then I've talked about uh, criti- two critical uh, methods for starving the beast. But then I talk about actually how to put this into practice All right. and uh, how to have a, a, a significant talk with a, well, from parent to teen that actually incorporates the concepts and creates a new beginning, pushes the restart button for parent-teen relationships. Wow. Oh, boy, that, this is so good. I'm just thinking, I, I'm a professor at a university, and I'm thinking how much my graduate students would benefit from reading this book. And I I imagine that, because we were talking earlier in the podcast, Neil, about how it can be so difficult to understand family therapy theory and concepts. And with this, it's kind of brings it down to a level that makes it very understandable. That's That was my goal is to make is to really simplify a lot of complex stuff and put it into some manageable pieces that most people can reach and utilize. Yeah. That's fantastic. Mm-hmm. So what all I'm going to do, I'm going to put make sure and put uh, the name of the book uh in the show notes so that if anybody wants to get that, they can uh, they can access it easily. I think this is such a great resource uh for the for the mental note takers. So I really appreciate you Uh, talking about this. And um, this last part of the interview, Neil, is what I refer to as make a mental note. And uh, it's something that you feel is important for the audience to make a mental note of in terms of improving their mental health or relationships. And I'm wondering if you have a tip or a suggestion uh, along those lines that might be able to help them. Okay, Chris. Well, I I think the most important thing for, and if I talk about this population of uh, parents and kids and teens, if I mm-hmm. talk about families, yeah. then uh, it's really easy for parents to get into a place where they really feel hamstrung and they feel stuck and they lose faith in uh, and lose pleasure in their family and they, and they lose faith in their parenting and they lose faith in, in their kid. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then they can blame themselves, they can blame their spouse, and they can blame their kid. And that's when I think things get impacted and in a really negative way. Right. And what I want the tip I would want to give parents is is to take blame out of the out of the equation, take fault and blame out of the equation, and then just say, okay, look, you know, we're all individuals. We all are who we are, and we're all doing our best. And Everything that everyone's doing is their best solution to the problem that they've got. Mm-hmm. Let's 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 get a more positive attitude here. Let me believe in myself. Let me believe in them, and let me communicate that, and let me exude that. Let me shine um, optimism and faith out there, and say, look, even if we're in a bad place today, we're fabulous. You're fabulous. I love you, and let we're going to figure this one out. Yeah. And so anything. Any intervention that anyone's going to make, any behavioral change, any limit that they're going to set, if it's done with a clear understanding of uh, love and respect, I think uh, it's going to work out a, a heck of a lot better. So have faith. So my message is have faith in yourself, have faith in your kids, and, and communicate that. And, and things are going to go a lot better. Oh, that's great advice. And I, you know, I was just thinking when you were talking about not blaming and not finding fault, I was thinking even for for uh, people in marriages or committed relationships, I think that they could uh, even benefit from that. Huh? 
Well, that's a whole nother conversation, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we, we won't get into that. So, okay. Well, Neil, if uh, a potential client or, or parent wants to contact you uh, about setting up an appointment with you, how could they do that? Well, it's real easy to do uh, through my website, which is neildbrown.com. And Neil is N E I L. So it's neildbrown.com. Okay. And uh, the name of my book is Ending the Parent Teen Control Battle. All right. And if they go on to Amazon, for instance, it'll be there. I think if they walk into their local Barnes & Noble or perhaps a, an independent bookstore, but I know the Barnes & Noble is carrying it, All right. they can get their own copy. And, Wonderful. Uh, and if they have a question, I have my own podcast, and uh, they can send me a question, and my podcasts are brief. They're Less, I try to keep them less than 10 minutes, right. and I answer questions uh, that come in from readers, uh, and I'll be happy to answer their questions. And if they would like uh, to consult with me, then we can set something up on a, uh, on a, remote, on a remote basis. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, I'll, I'll make sure and put uh, a link to your podcast uh, in the show notes as well. This is really fantastic information. Neil, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast today. You've really given me and I think the audience a lot to think about and um, I think there's a lot of great information here that can be used and uh, thanks again for coming on today okay Chris thanks for having me it was a pleasure okay all right wonderful stuff from Neil there and uh, man I just love family therapy concepts and um, that whole approach is just a really fascinating approach very complex in my mind anyway but uh, I love all the way of uh, thinking more from that system standpoint well here's my mental notes takeaway uh, from today's uh, podcast interview families can improve their relationships by uh, by not viewing one another as the enemy but instead make the negative interactional pattern the common enemy that they're aligned to defeat. Now, here's my question for you. Neil said that when a family is experiencing problems, each family member needs to do something to improve the relationships. Well, what was that? Well, he said that each member in the family needs to own responsibility for their participation in the dysfunctional pattern and for changing the pattern. Um, otherwise one family member will just blame another family member for the problem and the, and the problem will persist. So the key is to help family members develop an alliance against that dysfunctional pattern, which Neil refers to as the beast. Okay. Well, check out my website, chrisquarto.com for the show notes of today's podcast episode and uh, information in particular on how to get uh, Neil's book. I just ordered it myself. I can't wait to read it. Well, there's uh, only one more Make a Mental Note podcast episode. And as I said at the beginning of the pod of this podcast uh, episode, this series will be replaced by my new one called Private Practice Journeys. So this podcast is designed for uh, therapists that, that want to start or expand a private practice. And uh, it'll be on iTunes and Stitcher Radio, just like Make a Mental Note, as well as my website. So you can subscribe to the series just like you did for this one by using an app such as Downcast. And also, there's a Facebook community that I encourage you to join called private practice journeys community. So check that out because we already have a lot of people that have signed up for this in anticipation of the uh, private practice journeys podcast uh, series. Well, thanks as always for listening and really uh, appreciate you, the loyal listeners to this podcast series. Um, I couldn't have done any of this without you. And I really want to express my appreciation for all these uh, months of listening to the Make a Mental Note podcast. Have a great rest of the week.